Aloha from the East West Center in Honolulu, and thank you to viewers around the world for tuning into today's EWC Seminars Live webinar. I'm Susan Kreivels, the Media Program Manager at the East West Center. Our program today is China-U.S. Relations, A Way Out of the Abyss. This covers an issue that impacts all the world. We are pleased to offer such distinguished speakers today, as well as a moderator who has closely covered the region as a foreign correspondent. I am very proud to introduce our impressive lineup of panelists. First, our keynote speaker, Mr. Rick Waters, is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs, the US Department of State in Washington, DC. In this role, he supervises the Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs and the Taiwan Coordination Staff and has day-to-day -day responsibility for the diplomatic missions in China and Mongolia and the relationship with the American Institute in Taipei. His previous roles at the State Department include Executive Assistant to Undersecretary of State David Hale, the Director of Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs, and polit Political Counselor positions at Embassies Beijing and Islamabad and Consulate General Jerusalem. Mr. Waters has served multiple tours in China, including 1998 through 2001, during the accidental bombing of the Belgrade Embassy and the EP3 Hainan Island crisis. Thank you, Deputy Assistant Secretary Waters, for joining us during what we know must be a very, very busy schedule. And we know you will be leaving, uh, leaving us after remarks, so thank you. Our second speaker is Li Mianzhang, Associate Professor and Provost Chair in International Relations at Nanyang Techn Technological University in Singapore. Dr. Li is an Associate Professor and Provost Chair in International Relations at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang. He is also coordinator of the PhD program there. His main research and interests include Chinese foreign policy, Chinese economic statecraft, the Belt and Road Initiative, Chinese politics, China ASEAN relations, Sino US relations, and Asia Pacific security. Dr. Li is the author, editor, and co editor of 15 books including most recently, China's Economic Statecraft, and an earlier book titled, New Dynamics in US-China Relations, Contending for the Asia Pacific. Thank you, Dr. Li, for joining us. Sun Yun is a senior, senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia Program and director of the China Program at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. Her expertise is in Chinese foreign policy, US-China relations, and China's relations with neighboring countries and authoritarian regimes. From 2011 to early 2014, she was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, jointly appointed by the Foreign Policy Program and the Global Development Program, where she focused on Chinese national security decision-making processes and China-Africa relations. From 2008 to 2011, Ms. Sun was the China analyst for the International Crisis Group based in Beijing, specializing on Chinese foreign policy towards conflict countries and the developing world. Ms. Sun earned master's degrees at both George Washington University in Washington, DC and the Foreign Affairs College in Beijing. Thank you, Ms. Sun, for speaking today. Now I'd like to just take a moment to share our webinar protocols. Today's webinar is on the record, recorded on Zoom, and will be made available on YouTube for viewing and sharing. Viewers, your microphones and videos are turned off. Each speaker will make up to, make up to 10 minutes of comments and the moderator will ask the first round of questions. Q&A will then take place. To submit a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen and specify if there is a particular panelist you wish to answer. You can join the conversation now on Twitter using hashtag EWC Seminars Live, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at EWC Seminars. Finally, please check our website for webinar information, registration, full speaker bios, and YouTube links at www.eastwestcenter.org slash EWC Seminars Live. From there, you can also have access to information about other diverse professional, professional opportunities at the East West Center. 
Finally, I am just delighted to introduce today's moderator, a longtime colleague of mine and a distinguished alumna of East West Center Media Programs. Julie McCarthy is the National Public Radio Southeast Asia correspondent and has spent more than 25 years with NPR covering around the world. Her first post was in 1994 as the first staff correspondent in Japan. She recently returned to Asia to open the newest NPR Overseas Bureau in Manila. As NPR's Southeast Asia correspondent, Julie has closely followed events in Hong Kong and the geopolitical developments in the South China Sea. She was honored this year with an Edward R. Murrow Award from the Radio Television Digital News Association, as well as a Gracie Award from the Alliance of Women in Media for an investigation of a 75-year-old atrocity committed in Japanese-occupied Philippines during World War II. She's also been based in New Delhi after crossing the border from a posting in Pakistan, where she established NPR's first permanent bureau in Islamabad and won a Peabody Award for her coverage there. I am very proud to say that Julie participated in the 1994 East West Center's Jefferson Fellowships, which she says helped launch her long career as an international correspondent. So I am so delighted that Julie is our moderator. So Julie, I hand the program over to you and thanks. Thank you, Susan. I, it is, it, is a, it is a special privilege to be with you all tonight. As, as Susan mentioned, the East West Center did launch me into the world. It was from the center that I left for Tokyo on my first assignment overseas for NPR. And from there, I have circumnavigated the globe the past 28 years, returning to Asia in 2018 to report from Manila on how a democratic society was faring under autocratic rule. We gather tonight as the battle for democracy versus authoritarianism has been joined in Europe in ways we have not seen in 80 years. The battle also informs the challenges we find in the US-China relationship. When I arrived in Asia in 1994, Deng Xiaoping ruled and urged China to get rich, but not to flaunt it. Just a quarter of a century later, China is poised to overtake the United States as an economic power. The US has, it must be said, disadvantaged itself. The United States is absent from two of the biggest trade agreements covering the Asia Pacific, uh, the, the, the most dynamic region in the world. China is there. What will it mean for the United States to be on the outside? China bestrides the globe now with ever greater confidence, seeming to take advantage of a world distracted by the pandemic. We saw that in Hong Kong, where Beijing used lawfare rather than warfare, interpreting statutes to suit its purposes, tearing up treaties rather than rolling in the tanks, which many of us wrongfully, as it turns out, expected. Xi's desire to reunite Taiwan with the mainland has never been more alive. China is becoming increasingly active over the skies of the Taiwan Strait, bullying smaller countries like Lithuania, looking to partner with Taipei. China and Russia move closer as the world waits to see Putin's next moves in Ukraine. What lessons is Xi Jinping taking from the Kremlin as he eyes the reunification of Taiwan? What will the U.S. do in the event China invades Taiwan? Do the two great powers spiral into armed conflict? What can be done to avert a war in Asia? These weighty questions unfold as the Biden administration executes a so-called pivot to Asia to repair the breach the American partners saw under President Trump. Biden has marshaled Western democracies in a bid to align policy on China to confront its growing influence in the region. While it harnesses the power of allies, the United States must also engage with China, even as relations grow tense. How do we make them less fraught? How do the United States and China accommodate each other? What does that require? 
It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Rick Waters. He is the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs. We are eager to hear his insights into the state of U.S.-China relations and prospects for improving them and the challenges Washington confronts in driving China policy. Deputy Assistant Secretary, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Julie, and uh, thanks to Susan for convening this. I also want to thank um, both Dr. Lee and, and Sun Yun, who have been good uh, mentors. I've never met Dr. Lee, but I have read one, one or two of his books, and we're lucky to be uh, in an opportunity to have, have a bit of a discussion with all of you tonight. I, I do apologize that I've got to cut out a bit early, but I do promise you both I will watch this later when I finish my meeting uh, tonight. So let me let me jump right in. I wanted to talk about three areas. Um, first, I want to talk a bit about the state of the U.S.-China relationship. I want to talk a bit about um, the Biden administration approach, and then a little bit about how we view the the challenges in in a few key dimensions. Uh, some of which Julie mentioned in her intro. So I, I will not belabor the the points that we all know. I mean, this uh, the challenge of managing this relationship is. Um, complicated immensely by the increased aggressiveness of uh, Chinese foreign and external policies. I mean, we face a competitor potentially capable of combining economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to mount the type of sustained challenge um, to us and to the international system that we have not seen. Uh, I think for this reason, our, our recent Indo-Pacific strategy, which was issued by the White House, um, was pretty candid in noting that we view uh, the PRC's goals in the Indo-Pacific region as essentially pursuing a sphere of influence, and beyond that, um, seeking to become the world's most influential power in many domains. So I think it's fair to say that uh, the, this relationship um, is increasingly defined primarily, but not exclusively, by intense competition. And when President Biden met with uh, his uh, counterpart, President Xi Jinping, on November 15th in their virtual meeting, um, he was candid in t talking about the complex nature of the relationship today. He was forthright in discussing where our interests diverge. He was also uh, forthright in discussing where these interests align. And I think increasingly what we have tried to do is to build responsible guardrails to the competitive areas of the relationship to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. I want to just add one quick point about what our strategy is not. It is not an effort to hold back the PRC or to uh, inhibit ordinary Chinese ability to thrive, prosper, um, come to the U.S. for education, or much more. I think there are a lot of misunderstandings in this area, and I think it's important that we, we are equally candid about that. But I do think that we will be as strenuous in trying to protect the rules-based inter international order that we help build um, so that it's possible for fair competition to to exist for all of us. Um, you touched, Julie, a little bit on the Biden administration's initial approach, so I'm just going to touch very, very briefly on the, the the fundamentals of it, which started with rebuilding our, our investing in ourselves at home. And I think most who are on this discussion are well aware of the efforts that are underway here. In the foreign policy arena, it was the revised that was a key initial task. And much of the effort here at the State Department, at the NSC and elsewhere has been focused on, on this task with, with, with a number of goals, um, including advancing a shared affirmative vision as the secretary did on his recent trip to the region a few weeks ago. So we've made a lot of great strides in this area of rebuilding the alliances and partnerships. Um, we've resolved the aluminum and steel trade disputes with our European partners a nearly two decade old dispute with uh, between Boeing and Airbus has been put to rest. Um, we've launched AUKUS. We have strengthened the quad. And 
We've worked with the G7 to find common ground in new areas, including removing forced labor from supply chains. So there's, there's a lot of work going on to strengthen the alliances and partnerships. But, but I, I think with that as a framing element to the, the, the question that we pose tonight, I want to talk more about our uh, the ways in which we are managing this increasingly competitive relationship with the PRC. Um, so let's look at a few key domains. I'll start with the diplomatic. I'm sitting here at the State Department. Um, and I, I would commend everyone the, the recent Indo-Pacific strategy that was issued by the White House, um, which outlines the five key pillars of a, our positive U.S. vision for the region. And I'll only highlight the, the key points, which is that this vision is meant to be free and open. It's meant to be connected, prosperous, secure, resilient, and essentially allow countries to pursue their economic and security interests freely and in an unhindered fashion. A, a central component of this strategy um, is the forthcoming Indo-Pacific economic framework that President Biden announced at the East Asia Summit. And this is going to address a number of areas, including trade facilitation, digital economic standards, supply chain resilience, infrastructure, uh, decarbonization and clean energy, and a number of other areas. So again, I think that's that's the positive vision that we have for the region. Now with Beijing, in terms of our bilateral goals, um, I think the, the uh, some of what I mentioned already is really foundational. We've been very honest in talking about areas where our interests do not align or where we have fundamental disagreements. And, and I think you've seen whether it's the secretary and the president's discussions of the ongoing genocide and forced labor in Xinjiang, repression in Tibet, um, the ongoing erosion of autonomy in Hong Kong, or human rights and religious freedoms within the PRC. Um, we're very honest about those concerns and we've taken actions uh, reflecting them. Uh, at the same time, we have a number of issues in the strategic domain where we've had to discuss both our concerns and how we manage them responsibly. And I think this was most recently uh, the topic of discussions between National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and uh, uh, Director Yang Jiechi when they met in Zurich late last year. But I will say, and I'll come back to this after we uh, discuss the areas of that are largely competitive, we, we do have areas of cooperation too, which I think it's important to bear in mind. Now, in the diplomatic realm, I've talked a little bit about our positive facing vision, a little bit about our relationship with Beijing. I will say in the in the UN and international organization space, um, we are very focused on the PRC's drive to reshape um, norms and to devote enormous resources to advancing domestic policies. Um, within the UN context. So again, that's an area where we've been very actively engaged and will continue to be going forward. Um, in the economic realm, the there is no doubt that this is a competitive area of the relationship. Um, I'd commend to all of you, uh, US Trade Representative uh, Catherine Tai's speech last October in which she outlined the key elements of our trade policy. And I'll highlight um, two main parts, one, is that she she talked about our, our long-standing concerns about China's state-centered and non-market trade practices, none of which were addressed in the previous administration's phase one deal. And she said that we will use the full range of existing tools and we will develop new tools to defend against these practices. Um, another key point she emphasized is that we will em we will work with allies to shape the rules for fair trade in the 21st century. But I did want to talk a little bit about the economic realm beyond trade. There are many dimensions here, and I'll come to technology in a second, but I do think that economic coercion is an area in which we have increasing concerns, not just in the Indo-Pacific region, but when you look at the case of what happened to Lithuania recently and the the PRC's response for a sovereign government's choice to implement the contours of its one China policy, um, you know, we found that to be uh, immensely problematic and have been working with uh, the Lithuanians and other partners uh, to develop a response. 
Technology, the third area, the third domain, um, is central to the competition with the PRC. Here, I would say we, we should have no illusion about Beijing's objectives, which are to undercut our longstanding technological advantages and to displace the United States as, as the global leader in cutting edge research and development. I think we have to be honest about this. And we have been uh, using the full breadth of authorities available to the executive branch to protect our economic and security interests. Here at State, I'll focus quickly on a few subsets of where we are doing a lot of work. We are focused on uh, reducing the risk to the American people of PRC cyber activities. Um, we are focused on defending an open, reliable, secure internet. Um, we are actively advancing the setting of standards and norms for emerging technologies together with a number of allies and partners. And we are, we are looking to find ways to promote cooperation among like-minded groupings in areas ranging from uh, how technology re relates to democracy and much more. Um, last, I'll just touch on the reality that there is a, uh, an ongoing and growing body of concern about the use of surveillance technology in the human rights realm. The military dimension I will touch on only very briefly. Secretary Austin describes this, the PRC, as our pacing challenge. And I think many here are familiar with our concerns in the Indo-Pacific region in this area. Um, we also face challenges beyond the Indo-Pacific from PRC efforts to establish a more robust overseas logistical and basing infrastructure. Um, and we're, we're increasingly concerned with PRC and PLA activities in the realms of nuclear, cyber, and space. Finally, military civil fusion is a challenge that is multidimensional because it can have implications ranging from export control policies to how we um, look at the questions of university funding and student visas. Our response in this area is equally multidimensional. Um, and you know, we, in the interest of time, I won't go into it in too much detail, except to flag one item that I would really commend to many of you. Um, we don't always respond to military and security provocations in, in a symmetrical way. We have had a lot of really good work done to shine a spotlight on problematic PRC behaviors. And most recently, the department published a study on PRC excessive maritime claims in the South China Sea, um, uh, which I would I would commend to all of you. It's on the State Department website. I've talked about diplomatic, economic, technology, and military. I'll, I'll end just by touching on the influence and informational realm. And I want to make sure that uh, I, I really do want to commend to all of you a speech today by Assistant Attorney General Matt Olson, who in this speech moved us away from the China initiative paradigm that was a policy of the previous administration to a new paradigm in which we're focused on nation state threats from wherever they emanate in areas such as transnational repression and foreign malign influence. Now, obviously, China is part of this challenge, but it's not exclusively about China. And I, I'll let Matt's speech uh, speak for itself. It's, it's a very good explanation of the one element of the challenges in this realm. A second area is in the area of disinformation. And there's a lot of work going on here at State to combat disinformation. Um, and then finally, you know, I think we, we don't want to lose sight of the areas in which we remain convinced that our interests align and in which we are working very hard to find areas of common ground. Uh, I would highlight in these, um, in this basket, climate, where I think many are aware of the Glasgow Declaration that uh, former Secretary Kerry reached with his uh, Chinese counterpart. Um, counter narcotics, which is a very difficult area for, for many, many of us in America because of the impact of synthetic opioids on populations across the country. Here, we have had some areas of cooperation with the PRC, including the change of their legislation three years ago to ban fentanyl um, as a class of drug. 
Um, in the people-to-people -people realm, I, you know, I, I don't want to sort of loosely bucket it anywhere, but I do want to emphasize that we have really worked hard here at the State Department to keep people-to-people -people channels open. We have issued over 90,000 visas to Chinese students since our visa services resumed in the middle of last year after a, a brief hiatus due to COVID. And there are other areas that are loosely cooperative, including uh, uh, in the energy security realm. But to sum it up, and I think this is what Secretary Blinken said when he was first uh, confirmed a year ago, in this complex relationship, we'll be competitive where, where we should be and we'll be adversarial where we must, but we will be collaborative in the areas where we can be. And that, that is the complex reality in which we exist. Um, so Julie, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Deputy Assistant Secretary Waters. You have provided a strong platform from which we can dive into tonight's discussion and hopefully spur some great conversation. Please, a reminder, submit your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. But first, to help us better understand the state of US-China relations and how the two great powers might avoid miscalculations, we turn first to Dr. Li Mingzhong. Dr. Li joins us from Singapore, as Susan announced at the top of this program. He is an associate professor and provost chair in international relations at the Nanyang Technical Technological University. He says the US may need patience and a longer view on China's domestic politics as it impacts US-China relations. His main areas of research include Chinese foreign policy, Chinese economic statecraft, um, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, and Chinese politics. Dr. Li, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julie. And also, I, I'd like to thank colleagues at the East West Center for hosting uh, this event and inviting me. It's uh, my uh, great privilege to be part of this program today. And also, um, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Waters uh, for his excellent presentation, which was very illuminating. Um, I'm sure. We all understand that uh, US-China relations are at a very crucial moment right now. And uh, many observers worry that this relationship may slip into a new Cold War. And others believe that uh, severe strategic competition may have already become the new normal, which uh, poses significant challenges for both countries and their peoples. If we're talking about possible ways or approaches to save US-China relations from developing into a full-fledged and all-round confrontations, there may be many useful perspectives that we can discuss. But today, let me just focus on one particular issue. That is, I believe there is room for policymakers in both countries to try to downplay the impacts of domestic politics in bilateral ties. I will particularly make the argument that it would be good if Washington could revisit its views and the policy towards domestic politics in China. For quite a while in the past few years, many American political elites and policy pundits have been making the argument that U.S. engagement policy with China in the past decades has failed to transform China and making China to become a more open, democratic, and pluralistic political system. This argument has been used to support the idea that the United States should now almost completely drop the engagement policy and adopt a strategic competition approach instead. At the same time, in the past few years, in the actual operations of bilateral re relations, we've seen many conflicts between the two countries still stem from controversies involving domestic political issues in China, such as Xinjiang issue, Hong Kong issue, and other human rights issues in general. 
So clearly, ideological and political differences between the two countries continue to serve as a negative factor, even as a filtering fitter, lens through which political elites in both countries tend to perceive each other. And we can perhaps even make the arguments that many other substantive issues such as trade issues, trade disputes, and secure conflicts in the Asia Pacific slash Indo-Pacific have been aggravated by these ideological and political differences. Now, my view today is that I believe there should be more realistic in terms of what foreign actors, including the US, US government can do in influencing China's domestic political developments. At the same time, there may be good reasons for us to be patient and to be cautiously positive about the trajectory of China's political future. First, let's look at the big picture in Chinese politics. For now, there does not seem to be nationwide ostentious incentives, strong aspirations, and well-organized forces in China for dramatic political transformations in China. Decades of economic growth has indeed enabled the Chinese political elites to take advantage of the economic benefits that the Chinese people have received for the purpose of maintaining, even consolidating their political legitimacy. And certainly, as we all understand, nationalism has been used as a political tool to support political legitimacy in China as well. But back to the political reality in China. We can look at the survey findings of many existing studies, for instance, the third wave, the fourth wave democratization surveys. And also we can look at the surveys done by Harvard, Harvard Ash Center since 2003. In this study, they find that first, since the start of the survey in 2003, Chinese citizen satisfaction with government has increased virtually across the board from the impact of broad national policies to the conduct of local town officials, Chinese citizens rate the government as more capable and effective than ever before. Interestingly, more marginalized groups in poorer inland regions are actually comparatively more likely to report increases in satisfaction. So that's Harvard Eye Center's study. Uh, certainly, there are many human rights issues in China, and there are many daunting social political challenges that the Chinese political elites will continue to face in the years and decades to come. And there are good reasons to be at least cautiously positive that China's politics will not remain the same forever. The recent Big Data China project conducted by CSIS and the Stanford Center on China's economy and institutions finds that you know, while there are numerous nationalists in China, but there's also a silent majority who supports economic reforms and political liberalization. Many of us probably know what has been happening in a small village uh, in Feng County in Jiangsu province in the past three weeks or so. In, in response to online exposure of the horrific experience of a chain woman in a village of that country, of that county, numerous Chinese netizens expressed their outrage and demanded the government to investigate and address the issue. Online pressures succeeded in compelling, even forcing the local governments to to issue four reports only to be completely rejected by online activists. And as a result, the provincial government in Jiangsu had to conduct a fifth investigation. And the fifth report, which was issued two days ago, appeared to be slightly more credible. 
a whole bunch of government officials at the local levels were also punished uh, as a result of the fifth investigation. So in my view, this is a story of Chinese social activists using new technology to contend with local tyrants and call for the respect of social justice and social rights. And these sort of things happen almost on a daily basis in the Chinese society. Let me move on. I will also make an argument which might be controversial to say that you know, too much US intervention in China's domestic politics may actually not be helpful in changing China politically. There is a fundamental challenge for the United States. That is, there appears to be some moral contradictions in US-China policy. The reality, the reality is that when there are so many deep geopolitical and security conflicts between US and China, and when most Chinese people believe that Washington's security policy in Asia is aimed at containing China, the rhetoric that U.S. intends to help or shape China's domestic politics for the good of Chinese people, at least to some extent, loses appeal in the Chinese society. In recent years, under the background of deteriorating U.S.-China relations and in the context of U.S. pressures, suppressions of China's high tech, we've seen very significant growth of anti-U.S. sentiment in the Chinese society. One can certainly argue that this anti-US attitude has a lot to do with government propaganda in China, and I would fully agree with that, but government propaganda is not the whole story. There is fairly strong bottom-up backlash against some of the US policies in recent years. Such social atmosphere in China has created a situation which objective views about US political inter in interference in China, mostly from those Chinese public intellectuals, are criticized in the Chinese society as betrayal of Chinese motherland. Chinese public intellectuals, many of whom have been urging and calling for political reforms and political liberalization in China are now marginalized and even stigmatized and they keep quiet. To sum up, I have tossed out a few thoughts for discussion. I understand the enormous difficulties in putting these ideas into practice, you know, given the manifest destiny traditional mindset in the US and the complicated politics in the US and certain complications in international politics. In any case, what I'm trying to suggest is the question that I think may be worth pondering. And the question is whether and if the US can pursue a more balanced policy in response to Chinese domestic politics so that we can reduce a little bit of instability in bilateral ties. With that, I conclude my presentation and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, I, I, I felt <clears throat> rather inspired by the story of the outrage um, that prompted people to, to try to put a fire under their local officials to come to the aid of the woman who had been chained. Um, we'll, we'll have more on that. We will come back to you. Uh, just please, just a quick reminder, don't forget to send your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. But first, we're going to turn to Ms. Youngsun. Youngsun is the Stimson Center's senior fellow in Washington, DC. She's the co-director of the East Asia program and director of the China program. She's got a lot of hats. The Stimson Center, interestingly, has created a unique space for retired US and Chinese flag officers to exchange views, to chart a course over contentious issues. Um, in, in, 
in a way to try to find a way to accommodate the, these tensions and to draw down the tensions. It sounds very hopeful and perhaps we might hear more of that from, from Yonsen. But Yonsen, now you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Julie, for, uh, for the kind introduction and uh, great appreciation to the East West Center for hosting this, uh, this forum and also for the invitation for me to be here. The question that I was posted, uh, there are three questions. Is there a way out of the abyss from my point of view? Uh, what is the best way forward? Or is the relationship irreconcilable? Um, these are complicated questions, of course, and there's no simple answer to any one of them. But to the, I would say the positive side of me would say there's always a way out of the abyss, but it will require actions by both sides. And these are difficult questions and could be potentially politically costly. And given the political environments in both the United States and China, Genuine conciliatory actions are very difficult to come about because for three reasons. The first one is uh, these conciliatory actions may not see immediate returns. Actually, they may not see returns from the other side. That the reciprocity may not be there, which means that the lack of return or the immediate return um, will be politically problematic for the leaders who need that immediate return for political credibility and also for uh, domestic popularity, if you think about the US election cycle. And furthermore, individual actions taken by either or both sides may not be sufficient to move the general atmosphere and to change, or in this case, reverse some of the trends that we're seeing in the US-China relations in the past um, four to five years. For optimists, one path forward is to look at the achievement from 50 years ago. And this week, um, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of uh, Nixon's visit to China, which opened the door to US-China rapprochement, which arguably um, played a role in expediting the ending of the Cold War. And during Nixon's visit to China, uh, the Shanghai Communique was signed, which has served as, uh, as a fundamental document for the normalization of the bilateral relations. So if you are optimist, you could say that the leadership, the bravery and the courage demonstrated in these cases are necessary and indispensable to move this relationship uh, beyond the current quagmire that we're seeing. So it is a spirit to disagree on almost everything, yet still try to charter a path forward. This has been done before 50 years ago. Arguably the political context back then was completely different, but it's not impossible. But for pessimists, the path forward is, uh, is, 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 also, is, is also there, but a bit, a much less heartening uh, pass forward, which is the two powers will continue on their current trajectories and that they will come to the brink of a collision. And only by then will they have the political will and also the political desire to come to sit down and negotiate a peaceful coexistence. So the example here is the 1972 instance at sea agreement between US and Soviet Union. Basically, when the two power realized that if they continue on their current course, they're going to end up in a major collision. They will want to come together and talk about guardrail and talk about a rule of engagement that will help them to avoid that conflict. So as you can see, for the optimists, there is a way forward. And for the pessimists, there is also a way forward. Although the level of risks and the potential risk for military confrontation is vastly different between these two approaches. Between US and China, there are plenty of issues that the two powers could focus on and cooperate on. We see nuclear non-proliferation issues like North Korea and Iran. We see global common or global tradition, non-traditional challenges such as climate change. We see regional crises such as in Afghanistan, in Myanmar, even including uh, the Ukraine issue as we're seeing today. Cooperation between US and China will generate 
significant benefits and in, impact for the world. And the lack of that cooperation is not going to help in expediting the solution of any of the issues mentioned above. There are convergence of interest on the global level, but on the bilateral level, there are many divergent interests that are the anchor of the strategic competition between US and China. Especially if we look at the, at the approaches on the tactical level, if we look at the approaches the two countries have taken, um, they're also exactly the opposite. Washington's approach is what I call the issue compartmentalization, have a clear strategy that compartmentalize different areas of the bilateral relations. So Secretary of, uh, of State Blinken made the famous quote that the US approach to China will be competitive when they should be, collaborative when they can be, and adversarial when they must be. So with this logic, US will seek to compete vigorously with China in all domains, and at the same time, actively prepare to counter Chinese security threat, especially in the West Pacific. But based on this policy design, these competitive aspects of the US policy does not preclude cooperation. And on issues from climate change to regional challenges, the US does see converging interests with China and seek cooperation as feasible and desirable for both countries. But this approach also creates a lot of confusions and confoundment in China. Chinese have been grappling with what they perceive as a US inconsistency and self-conflicting approach, because for them, how could Washington see this compartmentalized approach as feasible? The competitive nature of the bilateral relations is not only toxic, but also determines that the two countries will seek all possibilities to gain upper hand, which means that the diverging interests overwhelm most, if not all, converging interests between them. So for Beijing, the panacea of man managing relations with US has always been issue linkage versus Washington's issue compartmentalization. And issue linkage means to leverage Chinese cooperation on issues from domestic market access to foreign conflict resolution to nuclear nonproliferation against the US in order to induce and extract US compromise on issues China sees as critical. And Professor Li Mai Senpai has mentioned a long list of such issues, especially focused on China's domestic politics. And the Chinese mentality is if US wants something from China, it must reciprocate and meet the Chinese demand on other fronts. When issue compartmentalization meets issue linkage, apparently these two completely opposite approach are probably the most important origin of the stalemates that we see today. While US sees competition and cooperation on separate tracks and are processed independently from each other, China sees everything as connected. So regardless of issue compartmentalization or linkage, neither US nor China can force each other to accept this approach to the bilateral relations. As such, I'm afraid the stalemate will continue. If China is unwilling to cooperate, US might have to abandon that track eventually. And that will push the competition and even confrontation to the front line. And it may not be the most healthy and responsible competition that people have desired, but then we go back to the original uh, speculation about the optimist approach and the pessimist approach that eventually there is going to be a way out. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yansun. And I do want to remind people again, please, uh, if you can get your questions in, please fire away. Uh, there, there seems to be um, some speculation here that uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary may still be on the line. Is there any way we can uh, get a, an, a, a confirmation of that? Because there are questions for him, if indeed he is. We know that he was uh, meant to, to leave us because of his crazy hectic schedule, but there seems to be some indication he may still be there. Is there any indication that he's still joining us? Not yet. I'm gonna jump to you, Yunsen, 
And I'm going to ask you, um, you, you mentioned this, this uh, Nixon visit to China, and we are marking 50 year anniversary of that. Um, he, Nixon goes to China. He and Chairman Mao agree to disagree, and it changes the world. What is wrong with that approach today? What is preventing that approach today? Any reason it cannot work today? Um, how do the U.S. and China accommodate each other? Um, what does it require? Are, are, are they up to it? Are these two sides up to it? That is a terrific question. Thank you, Julie. I would say the one thing that has changed fundamentally is the structure of the international system. We all know that back in 1972, while well, China was worried about the Soviet invasion of China. In fact, China devoted 70% of its national defense spending back in the 1970s in order to defend against Russia. So that was the context of China's reaching out or China's agreement to host Nixon and try to pursue this rapprochement with the United States. So within the Cold War context, it was a shared threat perception about Soviet Union that was the most fundamental anchor of the US-China rapprochement. But unfortunately today, uh, we don't have that anymore. So the Union is no longer is no longer there, and U.S. still sees Russia as a problem, but the U.S. also sees China as a problem. So I would say that with China's growth of national power and this uh, well, its comprehensive national power, China is already the global number two and the near peer status with uh, with the United States, and that fundamentally changed the structure of the international system of what what we are discussing. So if there is a strategic triangle, I would say that U.S.-China strategic competition is now the overwhelming theme of the, um, of the international affairs. Well, back then, 50 years ago, it was the U.S.-Soviet competition during the Cold War that was the thematic aspect of the, of the, international, uh, of the international system. So if you, if, you, if you look from that perspective, it will be very hard for US and China to return to the trajectory that they had 50 years ago because the condition had disappeared. But what has also changed is globalization, is economic interdependence. Currently, the US-China trade is still so significant for both countries and neither is willing to abandon their bilateral relationship for, for strategic competition. So there are elements within the bilateral relations that are still serving as a ballast or serving as a stabilizer of the bilateral relations. Although some would argue that trade relationship is actually turning into an irritant these days. Um, there is no easy answer to, uh, to this question and there's no easy answer out of this, uh, out of this quagmire. But um, I think both US and China realize that these, this is uncharted territory. And the two countries have never been in this state before. So it requires a lot of a new adventure and new exploration for the two countries to find a comfortable status for their peaceful coexistence. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lee, um, I, I have a question for you. It's something that I, I've pondered um, for years as I've talked to US officials. Um, and it is something actually that, that you indeed touched on. And it may actually be the spine of, of, of what, you, what you were trying to say. I, I have long puzzled um, over discussions with US diplomats and officials about China. Um, and, and, and their sort of concerted lack of concern that China had bullet trains that crisscrossed the country and the United States had none. Um, they never seemed to be concerned that China's roads and bridges seem to reflect the modernity that the US did not reflect. And the richer China got, the more laissez-faire that attitude seemed to be. Could you talk about this strategic decision to allow China to grow, to get rich, on the theory that they would be anchored in an international order and they would be a happy member uh, uh, of, of, of this rules-based order, the post-World War II international uh, order. There are some who think that group think, as you mentioned, now looks like a massive strategic blunder. Um, 
should the United States be treating China more like an adversary now? Um, prosperity hasn't translated into amity. Um, was the U.S. duped? Um, and, and why do you think the U.S. was so blasé about China's rise? Did they simply misjudge this? Well, thank you very much, uh, Julie. Um, yeah, that's a um, very big question. And certainly the uh, question can be related to many other very uh, important questions. Um, I would totally disagree with this um, conclusion that uh, US engagement policy in the past few decades and the um, uh, results that China has grown, um, or China has become more powerful, uh, suggests that the engagement policy and the role that US has played in China's development has been a disaster, a failure. Um, I, I, I totally disagree. You know, I, um, you know, fundamentally, we can look at the whole debate uh, um, away from state-centered um, uh, analysis or perspective, but is look at people, look at ordinary people. Uh, the growth of Chinese economy has helped um, get uh, over uh, half a billion people out of poverty. So the fundamental question is, do we really want to see so many people in China living in poverty, struggle um, with their lives every day? Uh, and, and obviously, you know, the, the growth of Chinese economy, the development of China has benefited uh, many other countries, you know, people in, in other countries, including people in the US as well. So I would say this is a, this is a, a very, uh, successful story of um, you know, coexistence, co-development. Um, and it's, it's, in my view, it's um, a brilliant, brilliant outcome for you know, millions, millions of people, especially in China. Um, and the next question is, you know, uh, now China is stronger, is more powerful. Uh, uh, what would be the impact on the international system? you know, all the rules and norms that we talk about. Um, well, certainly uh, you can easily find a lot of uh, facts uh, to say that China has been violating international rules um, and trying to create new rules and norms uh, that may not be uh, agreeable to some countries. But you look at the big picture and look at the macro level. I would say the process of China developing its economy, China growing, has been accompanied by another process of China joining the world, integrating uh, into the uh, global system. Um, and, and by and large, we see an enormous um, transformation of China because of you know, China's participation in international affairs, international institutions. Um, and um, you know, a lot of these, um, criticisms, a lot of the observations of China's um, you know, lack of, um, of, of uh, compliance with or insufficient compliance of international rules and norms um, can be explained uh, from different perspectives. Uh, there are some areas where you see uh, China's outright opposition, rejection of some of the values and norms, for instance, human rights, uh, and uh, in some cases, humanitarian interventions. Uh, but you look at other areas, uh, you see uh, a China that is more compliant uh, with international rules and norms. On, 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 um, on trade, finance, investment, you know, by and large, I see uh, the you know, compliance part of China's particip participation in international um, activities uh, is probably um, more obvious than the non-compliance, obstruction, and 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 disruptive role. Uh, but again, I, I I guess it all depends on how you know, you you look at all these facts. And um, so, 
I, I, my, my view is that I think engaging China, you know, encouraging China to continue to be um, uh, active participants, international affairs, international institutions, is still a better way, uh, a better approach. Uh, leaving China outside, you know, marginalizing China, isolating China, or confronting, uh, I think it will probably create even worse outcomes. Yeah, back to you, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I, I think it really does come down to this big question about how do we square this circle about what the West views as democratic values and a different view of how the world ought to be governed or organized. Um, how do we square that circle? It seems to be the, 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 the biggest, uh, it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room in many ways, isn't it? I wanna turn back to you, um, Yansan, because of what's, what's, what's on everybody's mind, many people across the world today are, are uh, anxious about events in, in Ukraine. Um, you have actually uh, written about uh, U Ukraine and, and it's uh, the, the view from Beijing. Um, you've written on the Ukraine crisis, Beijing's support of Russia and its limits. Um, why do you think Chinese policy makers, the policy community was surprised, as you have, as you have said, um, that Putin actually followed through on his threat? Thank you, Julie. Uh, if I may, I'd like to just first to follow up on the on the question that you raised with uh, with Professor Lee. Mm. Um, well, I think for <laughs> from the Chinese perspective, and this might sound like propaganda, but I I, I do see there's a, there's a, a, a bit of a truth to it, which is that given the different history, different culture, different background, and the vast diversity of the world. There cannot be just one system that fits all. And the Western democratic value may not be a universally true and universally applicable value for all the countries despite, despite their differences. And I think Chinese would argue that, well, as an oriental culture, as an oriental country uh, with a very different historical background that China may not adopt that same, the same political system. This is not to say that the the authoritarianism is necessarily the best way to go, but I think it does reflect that, that there are different views. For example, you're in Manila and there is election, but when we look at the quality of the election, I'm sorry, and look at the quality of the democratic system, I think there could be different judge, uh, diversify the judgment as for what, uh, what works the best. So this is not to defend China's position. This is just to say that what well, the Chinese will say that, well, for democracy, you should allow for different views to and different political system to exist, right? And there's not one universal choose. So I, I, I work on this issue quite a bit, especially in China's relationship with the uh, authoritarian regime. So this theme comes up constantly. And this is not necessarily the uh, but dividing the world into good and evil. And just like when we look at China and Russia, there is a little bit of, uh, I would say political sympathy and even a political empathy between Beijing and Moscow, when they look at the, their political system and how they are being portrayed and being um, marginalized and being criticized and condemned by, uh, by the West. So I think that political empathy between Beijing and Moscow does form a pretty important foundation of their, of their alignment because we're talking about the regime survival. We're talking about the legitimacy of the regimes. And this is always the most sensitive issue for the, uh, for, for countries like China and, and Russia. But then coming back to the Ukraine crisis and for our work uh, at Stimson, we host roundtables, private dialogues, track two dialogues all the time. And in the past 12 months, I have had at least a dozen conversations and meetings with, uh, with the Chinese side about the issue of Russia, including four over the past months. And the sense that I got from the Chinese was, had they known that Putin was going to intrude into Ukraine, the commitment that they made in the joint statement issued on February 4th between Putin and Xi would have looked very differently. So the Chinese were not convinced that Putin was going to in invade. And there was a strong sense that Putin was posturing and Putin was getting what he wanted. 
basically to force the West back to the negotiation table to deter uh, the NATO expansion, to inflate the international energy price, and also at the same time driving a wedge between US and European allies. So the Chinese were saying that, well, Putin was already getting everything that he wanted. There's no need for him to invade. And when the US submitted what well, presented all the intelligence that Russia is indeed, was indeed preparing for an invasion, the Chinese reaction is no, 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 no. Colin Powell also presented his evidence at the UN Security Council that many years ago about, about WMD in Iraq, and that turned out to be to be to be fraud, to be fake. So I think this um, this assessment in Beijing contributed tremendously to the fact that um, that China was caught off guard by putting intrusion into, into Ukraine. I think that also says a lot about the quality of their alignment, which I still do not call alliance because there's no mutual, mutual defense between the two. But when we talk about the authenticity, the sincerity and the quality of that alignment, I think this is a quite good example. Thank that you. Is, thank you. That is um, a, f a fascinating insight into how Beijing thought things were going to play out versus how they actually did play out. Um, staying on this, this question, Dr. Lee, uh, we're going to turn to the audience questions now. And here's an interesting question for you, striking off on what Yunsan has just said. Um, how likely is a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, of Taiwan? especially if Putin and his full-scale expected attack on Ukraine, the potential of a full-scale attack on Ukraine succeeds. How likely is a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, especially if Putin's full-scale attack, as expected, on Ukraine succeeds? Conversely, if Russia gets bogged down in Ukraine, do you think that would persuade Xi Jinping to stop think and refrain from aggression against Taiwan at this point? Well, thank you very much uh, for the question from the audience. Um, my immediate response is that I don't think the Ukraine incident, the Ukraine uh, issue is going to have any significant um, uh, real impact on you know, Beijing's decision-making with regard to the Taiwan issue. I'm just doubtful. Uh, you know, if you're talking about in the perspective of, uh, you know, putting Russia, you know, um, getting into the, you know, protracted trouble in Ukraine. And there have been uh, many such stories, uh, U.S., uh, you know, failure in Afghanistan, right? Does that serve as any sort of like, um, you know, inspiration, any clue for China's policy towards Taiwan? I doubt. Um, and um, the only slight impact I can, I can detect is you know, uh, weak, even moderate responses from U.S., from uh, European countries uh, towards Russia in the current context of you know, Ukraine, and if, if this, the situation uh, for the deteriorates, may be interpreted by policy elites in Beijing that, um, you know, U.S. and U.S. allies are just bluffing uh, in the context of East Asia, in the context of Taiwan. But again, I don't want to uh, read too much into this sort of uh, sort of um, uh, interpretation. And the whole issue of Taiwan and you know, how Beijing is going to uh, act um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the future um, will very largely, almost exclusively dependent on China's own assessments of its power versus the US and all other political you know, consequences um, and domestic politics, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think external influence on China's decision-making uh, over Taiwan uh, is minimal. Uh, and um, I, I noticed there's also a question about, you know, the possibility of many in China using war, using military force uh, to solve the Taiwan issue. I tend to believe that it's, it's unlikely in the, um, coming few, few years in the near future. Um, a number of reasons why. Uh, one, uh, it's almost impossible that we're going to see any official announcement or uh, implicit announcements uh, to be made by leaders in Taiwan to the effect that 
such announcements or move could be perceived by political leaders in Beijing as declaring independence uh, or creating de facto independence. I think that's very unlikely to, to, to happen. And that will eliminate the most immediate, most significant um, incentive or, or, or reason for Beijing to use force. And second, um, you know, you look at uh, some of the recent um, policy pronouncements coming from Beijing and some of the actual uh, actions, policy actions from Beijing uh, over the Taiwan issue. I, I, I believe that um, Beijing may uh, have some sort of agenda that would be aimed at maximize the efficacy of other policy tools uh, other than uh, the military. For instance, uh, the, the legal approach that we've seen in the case of Hong Kong. And uh, in recent times, we've seen some mention of you know, the possibility of mainland China using all sorts of legal means uh, to create conditions that would be favorable for final reunification. And in addition to legal approach, you, you, you can talk about economic means. There could be um, many economic policy tools that um, may be uh, available uh, to, to, to mainland China. And the, you know, uh, information uh, campaigns, uh, you know, uh, public opinion, uh, and um, uh, social economic policies aimed at encouraging people in Taiwan to work in mainland China or interact or to um, uh, stick to status quo. Uh, uh, and it, you're talking about the, uh, a, a list of these possible tools. I, I think um, the policy thinking in China, in mainland China is that uh, they will try to test out all these policy tools before they seriously uh, think about the employment of military force. And last point I want to make is, I think, you know, the Chinese official statement that uh, use of force will be the last resort. And that's, that's, that's probably very true. Um, it's, it's really, um, you know, it, it says a lot of uh, the truth about China's policy on the Taiwan issue. Um, uh, but we don't know when, but I suspect it will be um, at least some years in the future. And even if you're talking about a military scenario, uh, I, I can imagine it could be a combination of um, you know, some sort of military coercion, circumvent, uh, blockade, plus other uh, policy tools and means. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, it's reassuring to hear you say that force is going to be the last resort after a long list of other things have, have, have failed. Um, here's a question from our audience for both of you. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lee um, and, and Sun, Sun Yang, in your view, can you share three points um, that both the US and China need to undertake to reduce tension within the next six months. This whole question we've taken on tonight is about pulling back from the brink, pulling back from the abyss. Can you think of three things that both the United States and China can do to reduce tensions within the next six months? Very practical question. Press uh, Shen Yun can go first. Ladies first, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, <laughs> well, there are certainly things that, that can be done, but I think it's going to be difficult. And there's a specific reason, which is China's 20th Party Congress, which is like the overwhelming political event of the whole year. Um, and our political uh, affairs, domestic and foreign, will be geared towards the, uh, towards the Party Congress. Um, if there's three things that could be done, I would say that, well, China first should reconsider is, uh, well, actually not reconsider, but to drop is um, travel restriction because of COVID. Because the, the travel restriction is hindering the exchanges of everything. 
the exchanges of businesses, the trade, and also the exchanges of personnel, students, businessmen, scholars. Um, it's, it's, it's basically making things impossible. This week, well, actually not this week, but last week, Washington has seen the first Chinese scholar to visit Washington, the first one in two years. And it really reflects, the, the, the level of his popularity reflects a dearth of knowledge that people don't know what is going on in China. And in my experience, the same thing is true for China because there is a dearth of knowledge as for what is going on in the United States. So in order to, to rescue anything, to save, to save this relationship, we need to resume the normal communications between the two countries. And I think the travel restriction is going to be the first one um, major obstacle for, for that to happen. And second, I don't know whether this is feasible or not, or if the timeline even allows, and Des Waters probably knows this much better than I do, um, which is the senior level, senior top leader diplomacy. When the top leaders meet, they cannot decide on everything. But in order to create the positive atmosphere for their meeting, the two governments will have to think of ways to at least make sure that the senior leadership summit will go smoothly and there are concrete deliverables to reflect the progress. So not sure how feasible that is given the, given the COVID and the 20th Party's Congress. I think those, um, the senior, lead, senior leader uh, summit diplomacy probably will, will help as well. And the third, more practical issue, I think US and China need to come together and talk about Russia. Because uh, with, uh, with the invasion to Ukraine, uh, in, invasion of Ukraine becoming increasingly possible, and we are looking at Russia troops readying themselves along the border. This is the first time that the world is seeing the real possibility of a major war after the end of the Cold War. And it is unthinkable that Beijing and Washington are not discussing this issue seriously and in a substantive manner. I mean, yeah, Blinken and Wang Yi had a phone call two days ago and they talked about issues, and, but it seems that the Russia and Ukraine crisis is not receiving enough attention uh, and the prioritization from, from both sides. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, last suggestion is really uh, spot on, I think. Um, uh, Dr. Lee, um, uh, this is going to, uh, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, um, put forward the moderator's prerogative here. I'm gonna ask you to name two key points <laughs> in which both the US and China need to reduce tensions within the next six months. So we've just got, got a lot of questions and we wanna to get to them. Thank you. Sure, okay. Well, a um, lot of the tensions, a lot of the distrust that have emerged in bilateral relations in recent years can be traced to some of the rhetor rhetorical things. Uh, well, certainly these are not purely rhetorical. Uh, some of these uh, things have, um, you know, uh, substance and related to, to some of the facts on ground. But I suspect there's a need to, to moderate some of the rhetor uh, uh, rhetorical statements or some of the, you know, um, terminologies that have been used. Uh, here I'm talking about uh, things like the genocide, you know, forced labor. Um, uh, you know, a few few weeks ago, I published a commentary uh, in, in in a newspaper, and in that paper, in that uh, commentary, I suggest that uh, you know the U.S. and Chinese officials uh, could uh, you know uh, have some sort of discussion on the terminology of um, you know foreign policy from uh, from uh, uh, strength of power. Um, you know that 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 uh, phrase has been used uh, many times by uh, U.S. Uh, policy makers and senior officials. In the in the commentary, I I, uh, I explained that you know this particular uh, phrase has been interpreted by Chinese officials in an entirely negative um, manner. Uh, you know we know when Americans use this phrase uh, you know, from position of strength. Um, it actually also meant, uh, you know, doing things domestic in, in the U.S. to, uh, to, to, to um, make up some of the policy loopholes 
improve um, some of the things inside the U.S. education infrastructure, etc. The purely from the Chinese perspective, this is a show of um, completely show of muscles. This is a this is a intimidation um, intimidation against Chinese, and this telling China and Chinese officials that you know we are powerful and we're going to use force or use power uh, to 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 make whatever you know uh, U.S. wants China to do. Um, so a, a bit of exchange on this sort of thing. You know, what do you really mean uh, by using certain you know rhetoric uh, will be helpful. And here, a moment ago, mentioned in the genocide, really, it doesn't help, um, you know, to use this this terminology to describe uh, what has been happening in Xinjiang. Uh, it's it's certainly an exaggeration of uh, some of the policies that have taken place on the ground in the region, and it's 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 an exaggeration of the reality. Uh, first labor, I have sort of like a personal, um, you know, experience. In the 1990s, um, thousands of peasants and farmers in Sichuan province, Hanan province, would travel to Xinjiang you know, during the harvest season of cotton, uh, th two months, three months. And it's actually very um, uh, uh, profitable. You know, they could earn uh, an income you know, during those three two or three months uh, working uh, on the cotton field in Xinjiang. And that would be equivalent to the whole year's income that the migrant workers would earn in Shenzhen, in other cities, uh, in the coastal regions in China. Um, and we know this, you know, um, the manual labor picking cotton has, in, in, back then in the 1990s, although now machines do the job right now, uh, used to be done by a lot of peasants from the uh, Midwestern provinces in China, uh, and and they, we can we can talk about some of the nuances. Uh, you know, if we want to discuss uh, forced labor, for instance. But what I'm trying to suggest is that I think, you know, um, what language we use, what terminology phrase we use, it's always better to be more accurate and closer to to reality. Um, so that would be one. And second, I think uh, you know, if we're talking about the six-month time frame, uh, I think uh, there's a need for uh, more, um, more frequent exchanges between the Chinese think tanks and American think tanks. Uh, we know in the past years, uh, such exchange, such interaction has slowed down, to some extent has been suspended. Um, and this is very, very important because we do need these policy analysts um, and the policy advisors to be involved uh, in, 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 in good discussion on issues like Indo-Pacific, the Taiwan issue, and the AUKUS, and the Ukraine uh, crisis that's going on right now. Yeah. So those will be the two, my two points. Thank you very much. I, I, I keep hearing um, the question of nomenclature. Nomenclature has to be, has to be finely honed um, is, is what I hear you're saying. It cannot be inflammatory, but there is a bedrock concept that has grown up in, since 1995 in Beijing itself at the women's conference when Hillary Clinton to much ecstatic applause said human rights are universal rights. And that seems to be at issue here in this discussion here tonight, human, human rights may not be universal rights in, in a different system. And again, we're back to how do you square the circle? Either, you know, either human rights are, are universal <laughs> or, or they're subject to however you wanna determine a human right. And which leads me to this, to leads me to this question. Um, this, is from an, this is from the audience and, and this is from, um, uh, this is directed to Sun Young. It says, Sun Young comes close to, this is the audience member, Sun Young comes close to saying democracy is not for Asians. What about Taiwan? And is it reasonable outside of party propaganda to suggest that China 
has put forward its own legitimate form of democracy in quotes. That's a lot. That's a, ter <laughs> that's a terrific question. But first off, on the, on the issue of the human rights, well, human rights is universal, but what constitutes the most important human rights? I think that's subject to debate. And for the Chinese, I think they would decide, they would say that collective rights of the nation is probably more important. Well, that's at least what the government has been saying. But the bottom line is what constitutes the most important human rights is subject to the interpretation of that country or that people. And it's not something that can be imposed by another country on China and say, well, this is, this should be the, these should be your most important human rights. And therefore, China should adopt certain uh, international criteria or in the Chinese view, Western criteria. So I'm not saying that the Chinese justification is correct, but I'm saying that there are different interpretations in China. And until we could answer the questions related to, um, yeah, human rights is universal, but is a right to survival or the right to development a more basic human rights? And what if some people would say that the collective rights is more important than individual rights at a given historical moment? Again, these are I think these are uh, debates in political science that probably deserves more uh, more exploration. So let me rephrase. Let me re-emphasize. I was not saying that democracy is not for Asians. I said depending on the different historical experience, country could choose to have political system that is not democratic in the Western view or according to the Western criteria. So countries may not accept that the Western democracy is a universal value and that should be allowed. This doesn't mean that us other Asian nations or entities or entities and nations from other world see that Western democracy is the best value and is the best system that they want to pursue. But this does not exclude the possibility and the reality I would say in this case, that some country may say, well, maybe this is not our path. And it's not about whether this is an Asian country or not an Asian country, but this is about, well, if you think about the Chinese political system, I would say that the political popularity no matter how uh, it is based on the manipulation of public opinion or patriotism of nationalism in the Chinese society, the political popular popularity of the current Chinese regime is pretty high. And of course, we outsiders could also dispute that, well, these numbers are all fabricated. But then again, we go back to the uh, earlier question that how do we know anything that we know? Okay, we have about two minutes and I'm going to divide these between Dr. Li and Yu Yunsan. Dr. Li, here's a question for you. Recently, there has been an increase in self-censorship from US institutions, businesses, sports figures when doing business with China. Can you give your thoughts on how this is affecting the soft power of the United States? And if you think this will have an impact on the overall state of US-China relations, what's going on here? Hmm. Well, thank you, uh, Julie. We are aware of some of these um, things. Uh, in, indeed, um, you know, education institutions and um, business entities uh, in foreign countries, including those in the U.S., are now under increasing uh, pressure from China, from Chinese authorities, not to engage in certain activities, not to say anything. Uh, on some issues, there's uh, pressure uh, you know, on, on, on these entities to to say, um, yeah, this it's a reality. I mean, um, it happens in the cu current context of intense you know, tensions uh, between U.S. and China, and in the context of uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, you know, um, uh, negative interactions between China and U.S. involved in all these political issues. Um, I'm I'm not sure I can give a good answer. Uh, uh, to the question, what's what's going to, what impact we're going to see uh, for U.S. soft power, but certainly in my view, this is not good for China soft power, right? Uh, in, in fact, uh, you know, um, you know, many scholars will say this is not uh, the illustration or um, or use of soft power. It's it belongs to in the you know whole another category of mm -hmm. use of power, mm -hmm. um, sharp power 
or coercive power or whatever. I'm going to interrupt you right there, Dr. Lee. Uh, There's one more question. We're running out of time. Thank you so much. This one I'm going to give to Sun Young. Um, It's it's an important question. Was President Trump's withdrawal from the TPP, the multilateral trade agreement, a mistake? Um, Obama uh, envisioned it as part of a tool for containing China's influence, but many Democrats, including Sanders and Hillary Clinton, opposed it. Um, Was it was it a mistake to pull the United States out? Maybe not for political reasons, but more for economic reasons. Well, <laughs> well, as a well, as a traditional policy answer, the answer is going to be well. It depends. It depends on who is asking, and it, it depends on which angle that you are trying to make the judgment. That from a, uh, I would say, a foreign policy perspective. And from the perspective of effective competition with China in the Asia Pacific, with Indo-Pacific region, yes, pulling out means that the U.S. is no longer there. And China is able to manipulate RCEP and make sure that countries in the region will accept the China-dominated framework instead of a U.S.-dominated or at least a, a framework with U.S. participation. But on the other hand, I would also say that, well, there is a reason that Trump pulled out of TPP. And there's a reason that even with Biden administration, we're not seeing the United States returning to TPP. So this is not just a Trump problem. The problem here is that, well, we do have domestic protectionism and we do have domestic political constituencies that are standing to lose in a, in, in a more uh, free trade environment. So these domestic political concerns are the fundamental origins of the US withdrawal from the TPP and also why Biden administration is not returning to it. So um, I think these questions, again, these are complex questions that all questions have the origin, right? So we cannot just say, well, this is a bad decision, well, this is a good decision. Well, we will say this is a decision with a reasonable cause. And there is a specific political origin to it that unless and until we address that political origin, we will not be able to just easily declare that we're returning or we're not returning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ming Zhang Li and Yun Sun, and terrific audience participation tonight. Um, great questions, insightful answers. Thank you so much for joining us. I hand this back to Susan Cravens. Oh, thank you, Julie. And I hate to come in and say time's up. It's really been a fascinating discussion uh, on such an important topic. Thank you, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Waters, Dr. Li. Uh, Sun Yun and Julie for speaking in our program today. It, it was really your, your significant backgrounds and your expertise on the topic means this a really a very rich, diverse, and informative program on one of the most important issues facing the world today. So thank you so much. Thank you as well to our viewers for attending today's EWC Seminars Live. We hope you will join us at our next one. Please check www.eastwestcenter.org slash EWC Seminars Live for information, and we will be sending announcements. Finally, to everyone, mahalo and aloha from the 